If you've got your Bibles, um, turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And uh, this week I'd, uh, I'd been spending some time trying to come up with the, the message that I was going to share. And uh, to be honest, from about Wednesday I thought, yeah, I've got a pretty solid message. I, I'm, I'm going for this. I'm, Acts 15, I'm really looking forward to this one. I, I like Acts 15. It's a great chapter. And I thought, yeah, I can preach a really good message. And then Friday comes around and God says, no, change it. And, uh, and the, the thing was, on Friday, someone, uh, one of my friends got in touch with me. Um, said they were going through a really difficult situation. They just wanted me to, to pray for them. And really stirred something on the inside of me. And I'm, I'm quite a practical person. I'm a, a doer. And if there's a problem, I like to be able to go out and fix it and, and do something about it. And, uh, and something just really stirred on the inside of me. It's like, I need to do something about this situation. It, it's not, it wasn't enough just to stand there and go, God please help, and, and then just sort of go back to what I was doing on Friday. It just didn't feel enough, and so I felt, you know, I've, I've, really, got to, I've really got to put something into this. I've got to try and make an effort and go and do something. And so I went up into my office, and I took my guitar up with me, and, uh, and just started really praying and worshipping and sort of seeking God and saying, God, you need to minister into this situation. You need to do, uh, you need to do this, you need to do that. And I was sort of declaring these things and saying, God, we're speaking into this situation. We're speaking into uh, the problems that are going on. And I, I need you to do these things. And you know what? I really felt like I was sort of going up to bat for this, this friend who'd come in. And I, I, I'm quite a physical, practical demonstrations kind of person. And so uh, it's been a while since I've done a practical demonstration. So I thought I would do a practical demonstration this morning. And as I say, I... Uh, I went up to my office and I really felt like I was, I was going up to bat. And so, you know, I'd kind of gone baseball bat in hand, ready to give the devil some. And it was like, I got up into my office and I started praising God. And I'm like, okay, devil, where are you? Are you ready? I'm coming for you. And I was, I was, I was ready and poised. And uh, I know you're all panicking because the pastor's bought a baseball bat out. You're thinking, wow, the pastor must have had a really bad week. Uh, but it's not. But uh, it, I have to tell you the best story. When I went and bought this from Argos, um, the guy behind the counter turned around to me as he was giving it to me and said, are you right? Has somebody upset you? <laughs> And I so wanted to preach him and tell him how much the devil had upset me. I was ready to give him out. I thought, no, that's probably not appropriate in August. Um, but I, I was ready. And uh, as I say, I'd, I'd gone up into my office on that Friday. Um, it, was, it was about lunchtime on Friday. And I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going for it. I'm ready to bat. I'm ready to, to knock some, some demon heads flying. And you know what, I, I was really up for it. And Sam, I'm going to need you to help out. Don't worry, I'm not too. <laughs> um, but I've got some, some problems in here. These are, I, I thought I'd go, rather than baseballs, I thought that might be a bit dangerous. But what I want you to do is I want you to, to take some problems. And uh, what happened is, as I was up in my office on Friday, I thought, you know what, I'm really going to go for this. So these problems are coming up. I'm going to start knocking some about. So Sam, if you can start throwing some problems towards me. And, uh, towards rather than at would be great. And I thought, you know what, I'm, oh, come on, Sam. You need to throw better than that. Better throw. Up in the air. Let's see how we can go. And I thought, you know what, oh... <laughs> I knew it would happen. <laughs> Sorry, John. Have that problem. Throw me some more problems. So I practiced this last night. I thought, I better make sure I don't look like an idiot with this baseball bat and can't hit anything. I'm, uh, I'm doing really well. But, you know, I thought, sorry, Graham. And, uh, you know, I thought I'm going to get rid of some of these problems. <laughs> and so I was really in my office, just sort of going around hitting these problems away. Sorry, Sandra. We'll leave it there for a second. <laughs> And I, we'll leave it there for a minute, Sam. You can sit down. Thank you. Well done, Sam. <laughs> but that's the problem. Thank you, Sandra. You did exactly what I was hoping someone would do. Is you can hit the problems away as much as you like, but they start coming back. Sandra just threw it back towards me. And it's like, I was in my office. I thought, you know what? I'm really going to take a swing at some of these issues. I'm going to go to bat for this friend. I'm going to put everything I can into it. And you know what? I started singing a song that we were singing last Sunday, which we played on the, on the screens, which was, I raise a hallelujah. In the presence of my enemies, I raise a hallelujah louder than my unbelief. And I started singing this song. And something just happened halfway through this song. And it was very similar to what happened again this morning. Which is why I was talking a little bit earlier. Because what happened is as I started to sing, as I say, I'm a practical person. I like to be able to do something. And all of a sudden I just felt so useless. I stood in my office, praying and singing this song. And I felt useless. I couldn't do anything. There was nothing that I could do. 
it didn't feel like enough just to stand there and sing. And what I realised was that as I was trying to swing and knock some problems out the way, what I was doing was I was saying to God, God, I've got this one. I can sort this. And whilst the act that I was doing might have been right, the heart motive was totally wrong because it was like, I can come in and fix this. I can do something about this situation. I was ready to swing and start swinging. But the problem is, the longer you swing, the more tired you get. The longer you swing, the more chance you've got of missing some. Apparently, I missed them from the start. Um, But uh, as you stand there and you try swing in at these problems, you try and hit these problems away, you get tired, you get worn out, and you realize that you're being ineffective. And if you've opened your Bibles to 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 20, there's a very similar situation that happens here. And we're going to get a little bit of context, so we're going to read from the first verse. And 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1, it says, It happened after this that the people of Moab, with the people of Ammon, and others with them besides the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was the king of Jerusalem at that time. And they said, Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazan, Tamar, which is En Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord and from all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple. And cry out to you in our affliction and you will hear and save. And now here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. But they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given to us to inherit. O our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. We're going to pause there for a second. You see, the interesting thing is that when problems come at us one by one, like Sam was throwing them, sometimes you've got enough power to start batting them away. But there are times when problems don't come one at a time. In fact, quite a lot of the time, problems don't seem to come one at a time. They seem to come a multitude at once. And that's this word that Jehoshaphat uses here. He says that there was a multitude of people, three different nations, had teamed together to come against the land of Judah. And Jehoshaphat turns around and prays to God and says, God, what do we do? We have no power to defeat them. In our own strength, we're not able to beat the problems that are coming against us. We spared these people when we were stronger than they are, and now they've teamed up together to come against us and want to defeat us. This is the payback that we get for sparing their lives in the first place. It didn't seem fair, it didn't seem right, and it seemed like there was no hope. This morning I want to pull out four points that Jehoshaphat and the people of Israel gave as a principle for how we can stand in situations that come against us, the right way to stand against situations. And so we're going to read on from verse 13. And it says, Now all of Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. A lot of names in there. And he said, listen, all of you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow go down against them, they will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jerul. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position your sandals, stand still, 
and see the salvation of the Lord, who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. I'm going to pause there again for a moment. As I say, there's four things I wanted to pull out in the way that Jehoshaphat dealt with this situation. The first thing was that Jehoshaphat went to God and said, God, I don't know what to do. I don't have the strength to sort this situation out myself. I don't have the ability to fix the problem, to defeat the multitude that is coming against me. Sometimes we just have to be able to turn around and say, you know what, God, I can't fix this myself. As we were saying earlier on this morning, sometimes we just need to be able to surrender and say, God, I can't face this situation. I don't know what to do. I need to give it over to you. But what I notice is as he surrenders it over to God, he calls the people of the land to to start praying. And as they start praying, there's a guy who hears from God, a guy called Jahaziel, something like that. That's how I'm going to call him. We're going to call him Jay. Um, There's a guy called Jay who hears from God and shares a word with them from God. And so the first point I want to make this morning is that when you're facing a problem that feels unfaceable, unwinnable, surround yourself with people who will hear from God. Because you can choose to put yourself in a situation where you go, you know what, this problem's impossible, I don't know what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go and sit in a corner and do nothing. I'm just going to try and hide from the problem, or I'm just going to say, you know what, I can't face this, I don't know what to do. But Jehoshaphat surrounded himself with people who were able to hear from God, and hear what God had to say about the situation. The first thing we need to do is position ourselves to hear people around us who can hear from God, who will give us encouragement, who will tell us who we are. One of the wonderful things that I love about Jehoshaphat's prayer in the first few verses is that he stands there and he declares who the nation of Israel are. He doesn't say, God, we're helpless, we don't know what to do, we have a problem. He says, God, this is who we are, this is who you've called us to be, this is what you've said our identity is. Now these people are coming to try and come against us. What are you going to do? So many times we face a problem and we go, God, I don't know what I can do. I feel so small and insignificant compared to this situation. When really what we should do is declare, God, this is who you call me to be in Christ. This is the identity I have. This is the position I stand there. I know I have the authority in this situation. God, how are you going to reveal yourself in this situation that's coming against me? How are you going to reveal yourself against the enemy that's trying to rise up against me? We have to know what position we stand in. And that's one of the things that uh, Jay reveals in this prophetic word from God. We see that... In verse 17 he says, you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. So this is the second and third thing that we need to do. The first thing is that we need to surround ourselves with people who will hear from God. The second thing is we need to position ourselves. You can choose where you stand in a battle. You can stand in the corner hiding and say, you know what, I don't think I can do it. Or we can stand in the authority and the understanding that whatever this word says about me is true and I will stand on it, believe it, and know that I will overcome the situation because of what the Bible says about me. You know, there's an interesting thought that I had was that I've I've grown up in church all my life. I've learned scriptures from such a young age and there's so many scriptures that I could quote out of the Bible off the, off the back of my, my hands that, that saying doesn't make sense at all but uh, the, there's so many scriptures that I could quote but you know what this is useless if all you can do is quote scriptures that you know and say things that are in the bible but don't believe it it's absolutely useless Because all you're doing then is standing on your own strength, standing in your own knowledge and saying, you know what, I know what the Bible says, I know these things. And so we start to say, you know what, this is what the Bible says. But if we don't believe it, if we don't understand it, and if it hasn't sunk into our heart, it might as well sit on the floor. But when we say, you know what, God, I know who you've called me to be. I will stand in the authority that you've given me and I will surrender everything to you. I will kneel before you and say, you know what, God, I don't know what I can do anymore. I was in my office on Friday and as I said, I got to this point where I just felt so helpless. So useless because I just couldn't do anything. 
and I was playing my guitar and singing along to this song and I just ended up on my knees. And as I knelt down, I just began to cry and sob. And something broke in me. And I said, you know what, God? I can't do it anymore. I can tell you the scriptures that are in here. I can tell you who you say I am in this situation and who you say my friend is in this situation. The things that your word says, but it, it hasn't sunk into my heart yet. There are parts of the Bible that have definitely sunk into my heart, but in this situation, it wasn't there. I knew the scripture, but I couldn't say that I believed it because everything in me wanted to be the problem solver. Everything in me wanted to be able to fix that situation and deal with it myself. And in that moment of sitting on the floor, kneeling with my guitar, and just floods of tears coming down my face, snot everywhere, I got a cold anyway. It wasn't helping at all. And I sat there and said, God, you've got to do something in this situation. And as soon as I said that, I positioned myself with what the word said. It sunk into my heart, and I knew that I could stand on what God had said. I positioned myself. But what he says in verse 17, he says, You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. We surround ourselves with godly people. We position ourselves in the authority that we have as believers. And we stand still. That's the third thing. We don't have to fight in the battle because God fights the battles for us. You know, there's a really interesting thing about this story. It's one of my favourite stories in the Old Testament. And I've read it quite a few times, but I missed something. And I only saw it this week as I was reading it again on Friday. And as I was reading through it, it carries on um, from verse 18. And it says, And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshipping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of Kothlehah, of the children of Korahada, stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekeo. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercies endure forever. This is the fourth thing. And it's very much in line with the song that we sung last week. It says, I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. And there are so many times in the Old Testament where we see that the singers are sent out first. And that's not because they didn't want to waste the good soldiers getting killed at the front line, so they send the singers out and the noisy people first. That wasn't why the singers and musicians went out first. It's because our power comes in praising God and declaring who he is and who we are in a situation. And so as I was in my office on Friday... I began to declare and sing over this situation. I started singing that Raise a Hallelujah again. And I was going back over it and back over it. And then I went on to another song that declared the faithfulness of God. And you know what? I came out of my office after about an hour or so and I thought, God's going to do something. God's going to do something. And then I got a phone call from my friend. Or I spoke to my friend a little bit later on. And it had got worse. It had got so much worse. And you stand there and you begin to doubt. And I'm sure all of us at some point have had that situation where we stand there and say, God, I thought you were going to do something. You see, the misconception I'd always had with this chapter is when he said, go out and tomorrow stand, position yourself, stand, and God will win the battle for you. This is what my perception of that was, that the army would wake up the next morning they would step out the front door, stand on the hill, and they go, oh, look, they're all killing each other. Oh, that's nice. Yay for us. And then they go home, and that was it. My perception was that it was an instant thing, that they went outside the next morning, saw it happen, and it was done. But what I didn't realize is that there was a heck of a trek that they had to go on between where they were camping that, that night 
and to where they were going the next day. Because what happens is in the meantime, we read this from verse 22. It says, Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. So when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewellery which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days gathering the spoil because there was so much. And on the fourth day they assembled in the valley of Barakat. For there they blessed the Lord. Therefore the name of that place was called the valley of Barakat until this day. You see what happened is in the time that it took them to walk from where they were that morning to that point where they could see the battlefield, the two armies out of the three decided that, you know what, we could double cross the third one, kill them, and then there's more for us when we defeat Judah. So they went up against them, killed all the people of Mount Seir, and then the two armies turned against one another and started killing each other so that all of them had killed themselves. And by the point that the people of Judah got to the mountain, and saw down into the valley where that battle had taken place, they saw that the battle had already been won. See, my understanding was that they went out, stood on the mountain, watched as God did it, but actually when they got to that point where they could see, God had already done it. My misconception was that when things don't go the way that we expect, like on Friday when I stood in my office and thought, you know what, God's going to do something, and then I come and find out later on that it's just got so much worse and you think God what's going on and the temptation is to try and pick up the bat again the temptation is well God if you're not going to do it I better start swinging again and as those problems seem to come up you think you know what I better start trying to hit them away a bit more I better start trying to hit them a bit harder and what we do is we pick up the problems we don't stand in the position that God's called us to stand in the authority and wait for him but actually we begin to try and start swinging for ourselves again and say, you know what, I can, I can do it. Maybe I just need to push a little bit harder. And there was something that just, I guess, clicked in me on Friday afternoon. And I just, I guess I got to that point where I thought, you know what, I can't keep swinging because there's absolutely nothing that I'm, I, I'm hitting thin air. I'm not, I'm not making an impact. I'm not doing anything. And so I stuck the music back on again. And quite a lot of people have done prayer walking and things like that. I, I like to prayer drive. Um, two reasons. One, I'm lazy. And two, I like to drive. Um, so, <laughs> so I got in my car and I just started driving around and, and driving over different, different uh, areas of the, the town and just started re-declaring different things over the town and, and singing these songs and, and this raise a hallelujah was on. And so I was declaring this and then I'd turn it down and I'd pray a little bit and declare who I am in Christ and who these people are in Christ and the situation they're in. And then I'd drive somewhere else and start declaring these things and something changed. Because what happened was what I said was, you know what, God, I can't do it anymore. I don't have anything that I can do. You're going to have to do it. And so what happened was rather than me picking up the bat, It was like me turning to God and saying, God, have you got this one? And God turned around and went, yeah, watch. So Sam, throw me another one. Yeah, you back up. Or Graham can throw me one. See, as the enemy's problems came in, God went, you know what, I can deal with this. Sam, throw me another one. Another problem came and said, I can deal with that one. I can deal with that one. You see, we can try and hit them back and say, you know what, I'll do what I can. Or we can turn around to God and say, God, have you got this one? He goes, yeah, no problem. Thank you, Bill. Nice problem. No problem for God. (laughs) See, we can stand there and try and do it ourselves. We can stand there swinging the bat until we're blue in the face and ready to collapse. Or we can get to a point where we say, God, I'll go surrender it to you. God, I'm going to praise you until I see the enemies fallen before me. I'm going to praise you until I see these circumstances change. And until I do, I will sing and declare of who you are and who you made me to be. 
I will declare over my family, I will declare over my friends, I will declare over this town who you are and who I'm called to be. I won't try and pick up the bat myself. You can deal with the problems. I'll deal with getting me in the right place. Surround yourself with godly people. Position yourself in the authority that God has given you. Stand still and praise God. Four things. And you know there are so many problems that that come against us. And as I was saying earlier on, there's people in this room that I really feel are swinging the bat. They're really trying their hardest. They're trying everything they've got. But sometimes we just have to raise a hallelujah. We have to say, you know what, God? It's your turn. I can't do it anymore. It's over to you. And so we're going to sing this song again. We sang it last week. We're going to sing it again today. We're going to stand together as a church and we're going to declare over our own lives, over the lives of our family and over the lives of the family of this church that our weapon is a melody that we will stand strong and watch as God defeats every problem that comes against us so hopefully Crystal's got that ready for me I'm going to encourage you all to stand the words will come up on the screen yeah we're going to grab the worship team up and we're going to take up the offering because we haven't done it Uh